Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me to teach you uh, about pediatric HIV infection. Uh, first of all, I must say that I also have very little experience in pediatrics HIV because we have very small number of cases. Uh, so uh, for some years, we didn't have any new patients. So actually, compared to other clinics, uh, Colombo Clinic, we are managing the uh, biggest number. We have about 12 children with HIV. So compared to other cohorts, I think we have very small number. And newly diagnosed patients also very little, maybe one or two a year. But unfortunately, this year we had seven cases. So I think though it is rare, it is very, very important for you all to uh, identify them and refer to us. Because if you don't know uh, when to suspect HIV and when to order an HIV test, these children might ultimately die of AIDS because uh, they might progress rapidly and also uh, they'll be treated for some other infections thinking that uh, nobody will think of HIV. Because it is rare, it is, it is not coming under your differential diagnosis. So my main aim, maybe you can use this for your exams, but main aim is to uh, uh, increase your awareness so that you will be able to diagnose more and more patients. In a country like ours, it's okay to do, I mean, 1,000, even 10,000 uh, tests to get one positive. Because even then it is cost effective because managing a late stage with HIV patients is very, very expensive. So it is okay, uh, do a little more testing, spend a little money on HIV testing rather than managing a late stage HIV patients. It is a burden for the family, burden for the child and also burden for the country. And by the time we diagnose, they may have passed it on to some others as well. So, uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce you to the HIV and then we'll be discussing the pediatric HIV management. So I will be discussing uh, uh, just a bit of epidemiology, a uh, few slides and also mode of transmission, especially I know, I'm sure you all know the mode of transmission of HIV among adults and even pediatric, but just to refresh your memory and clinical features of HIV because it can be a little bit different from adults. And how to diagnose pediatric HIV, it's very important because it's a little, it's a little bit uh, different from adults, especially uh, when it comes to children below 18 months. Uh, and also management, and I will also just touch upon mother-to-child transmission of HIV. So as you know, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And as the name says, this is a virus which can only infect human beings. And we will discuss why. And AIDS, I mean, in those terms, people call any HIV positive patient as AIDS, which is technically wrong. Uh, because uh, if they are diagnosed and started treatment, majority will never go into the AIDS state. Uh, so most of our patients are diagnosed uh, before they go into AIDS stage, if they are on antiretroviral therapy, they will never uh, go into this AIDS stage. Therefore, it is technically wrong because when they develop, uh, uh, when their immunity goes to a very low level, when they have certain specific conditions, only we call them have as having AIDS defining conditions. So, otherwise, they are HIV infected patients. So, as you know, it belongs to a retroviral group and uh, uh, a subspecies lentivirus, it has a clonic pose and uh, it has a very long latency. So somebody can get infected with HIV but remain asymptomatic for a very long period of time. But it is a systemic illness from the very beginning. So virus will enter almost all organs of the body and establish in certain places. Sometimes the virus remain latent. So these latent viruses are not uh, killed by the antiretrovirus, therefore we can't cure uh, HIV by giving antiretroviral therapy. So there are two types of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 is the commonest all over the world. Sri Lanka also, we almost 
99% of our patients belong to HIV-1. Uh, HIV-2 are common in Central Africa, some parts of the Europe and India. And But it's important to be aware about HIV-2 as well for several reasons. One, HIV-1 uh, one is progressing rapidly, whereas HIV-2 progression is relatively uh, relatively slower and HIV-1 transmission risk is much higher as compared to HIV-2. And uh, for management, HIV-1, HIV-2 generally do not respond to one group of antiretrovirals. Those are non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors. That group is, in, uh, HIV-2 is intrinsically resistant to uh, NNRTI. Therefore, if it is a HIV-2 patient, uh, we should not treat them with NNRTI. And uh, other important thing in your thing, I think it has become a fashion to do uh, molecular testing nowadays. After the COVID epidemic, everybody, when there are uh, PCRs, they think that is superior to every, everything else. But yes, for HIV also, we can use molecular testing, but it is tricky because most of the molecular testing available uh, R can detect only HIV-1. If you do HIV uh, molecular testing, if, if the patient is infected with HIV-2, there is a risk that you might miss. Therefore, always it's better to do the screening test like ELISA or rapid test as the screening test, then we need to go for confirm. And monitoring also, we can't use the normal viral load testing uh, because most of the commercially available viral load testing can detect only HIV-1. So their samples need to be sent to a specialized laboratory to uh, get their viral loads, whether they are responding to treatment or not. So therefore, differentiating HIV-1 and 2 is important in clinical management as well. But in Sri Lanka, we have only few cases, maybe two or three. Uh, so those cases need to be uh, known and they need to be managed accordingly. And uh, this is the HIV viral structure. I'm sure you all are familiar with this. It has an envelope with GP 120 and GP 41 uh, uh, antigens. And it has the core, which consists of several uh, core proteins. And it is a RNA virus with two single strands of RNA. And these HIV enzymes are there. It's very, very important because all uh, diagnosis of HIV is based on detection of antibodies against these proteins. Therefore, it is important for us to have a little uh, uh, idea about the structure. And also these enzymes which facilitate the replication of HIV. So antiretroviral drugs are produced by blocking these different uh, steps of replication. Okay, therefore, it is applicable in clinical practice as well. So, as it is important, I think I'll briefly go through the life cycle. So, HIV virus has this GP120 portion. It will bind into CD4 receptor. So, any cell which bear the CD4 receptor can get infected with HIV virus. So, after it uh, binds to the CD4 receptor, it will fuse with the cell membrane and it will release its uh, nucleic material into the human cell. And this RNA will be soon converted into DNA, double-stranded DNA by reverse transcriptase, which is a HIV enzyme. So that will facilitate the transcription of RNA to DNA. And most important drug class, which is NRTI, uh, it acts by blocking this reverse transcription step. And this DNA then will uh, go into the nucleus and integrate into the human genome. And uh, so that is facilitated by integrate, uh, integrase hormone and uh, integrase inhibitors, one of the first line drugs that acts by blocking the integration of viral DNA into the human uh, genome. That is why HIV virus can't stay outside the human body because the virus can't replicate by its own. It enters into the nucleus and hijacks the, our own replication mechanism. So it needs the human genome to replicate. So without that, 
the simple question that everybody asks, can it be transmitted through mosquitoes? It can't because uh, it can't survive outside the human body. So using the human genome, it will replicate and produce daughter RNA. So these RNAs uh, will assemble into the virus with the capsid, capsid protein and that step is facilitated by the proteases. Okay, so blocking that protease inhibitors uh, can block the HIV replication. And after that, they will bud from the cell surface and go and infect another cell. So that is the life cycle of the HIV virus. It is, as a clinician, I remember it because our drugs are working on by blocking various steps. Otherwise, that's an uh, area of virologist uh, or microbiologist. So, uh, so as I told you, the C, uh, HIV virus come and attach to a CD4 receptor. So any cell which has CD4 receptors can get infected with uh, HIV virus. So it is mainly the T lymphocytes, but monocytes, macrophages, Langerhans cells, and various other minor target cells could be there, uh, which can get infected with HIV virus. So once the virus enter into the body, either through the Dental mucosa, blood, or even gut mucosa in a patient who is drinking the milk, it can go through the gut mucosa. So it entered into a cell which have a CD4 receptor, multiply there into thousands, and go into the regional lymph nodes. And through the lymphoid system, it will go into the blood, and through the blood, it will go all over the body, uh, liver, spleen, brain, and bone marrow. I think. So when you get needle pricks, we ask you to come within 72 hours. Why? Because this virus becomes systemic. It enters into the blood within 72 hours and disseminate all over the body. So by that time, no point in after that period, once it is disseminated to organs, uh, it will uh, stay inside those organs silently. So there will be reserve, silent reservoirs. Once those reservoirs are developed, there is no point in giving prophylaxis. So that is why if you get a needle prick, you need to come immediately. If you come immediately at this mucosal level, it will be quickly, replication is blocked. Therefore, there will be a reduction of the risk of transmission to a very great extent. So, uh, so this is what happened to the viral load and the CD4. I, I, I hope you know the viral load is the most important prognostic sign, uh, prognostic factor in a HIV positive person. So just soon after the acute viral infection, uh, uh, virus enter into the body, uh, the virus will shoot up. Within two weeks, there will be millions of viruses produced by the uh, 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 virus because it uh, has a very quick replication. So. By the time of uh, two weeks or three weeks, it will be 10 to the power 7. Okay, so, uh, and once the body identifies there is a virus, it try to control it, but that is not a 100% control. But the viral load will go down after about another two weeks, that is around one month. And then it will remain at a low level for a long period of time. So, uh, during the acute zero conversion illness, uh, if somebody gets exposed, there is a very high risk of transmission because though the period is short, that uh, during that short period, because of the high viral load, risk of transmission is very high because always the transmission is directly proportionate to the amount of viruses in the blood. Once uh, your viral load goes down, the risk of transmission goes down. Okay, so they will remain, this low viral load will be uh, maintained for a long period of time. Then, uh, but once the body's immune mechanism is gradually weakened, the virus starts shooting up, then again it will go up to millions. The yellow line indicates the CD4 count, and uh, CD4 count generally in a normal person uh, will be 500 to 1500, but in children it will be totally different. They will have a higher CD4 count, and you have to interpret always with the tables, uh, with the reference. Uh, Ages because it, the interpretation should be according to the age category. So it will drop down during the acute stage, but it will go back, not back to the normal, but to a certain high level. Then it will gradually start 
dropping down again. So the CD4 count is very important if the patient present with late stage HI. So if they are presented very early, CD4 count doesn't matter. They will have a preserved immunity. Therefore, we don't go on monitoring CD4 count. It has no prognostic uh, uh, significance. But when they present late in HIV, CD4 count is very important because depending on the CD4 count, we have to think about what differential diagnoses are possible. So lower the CD4 count, you are likely to get more and more opportunistic infections. So depending on various level, we know these are the possible infections. If it is less than 50, cytomegalovirus, mycobacterium avium, so uh, all opportunistic infection. But if it is more less than 200, it may be uh, uh, pneumocystis pneumonia and uh, more virulent organisms about 350, even TB, other normal bacterial infections, those are common. So if the patient, you think patient in late stage, CD4 is very important in your management, but if they are asymptomatic, for example, if a child is diagnosed uh, in contact screening, if the mother becomes positive and other children are screened and they are totally asymptomatic, then the CD4 count doesn't matter. So these are the antibody and antigen markers during HIV infection. This is also very important. But in children, as you know, uh, they they will have their uh, there will be transplacental transfer of antibodies. Therefore, uh, they can have positive antibodies despite being negative. So maternal antibodies will cross the placenta and will be available in the baby's blood. Therefore, up to eighteen months, a positive antibody test does not. Uh, say that the baby is HIV infected. Always you need to do molecular testing. We'll discuss about it later. Uh, so there are, uh, during, uh, just soon after the infection, they will develop acute retroviral syndrome. But in children, uh, this stage may be sometimes in utero or it may go unnoticed. Uh, then they will seroconvert from HIV negative to HIV positive. And most of the time they will be asymptomatic. It might last for 8 to 12 years, but in children, generally the progression is a uh, little bit faster. More children will progress faster uh, as compared to adults. Therefore, it is very important for you to identify the H H HIV indicated conditions as soon as possible. Therefore, uh, you can hold the progression. If they are not diagnosed and start a treatment, they will go into the symptomatic stage where they can have multiple infections. Okay, so this is the same thing in a graphical representation. So uh, if you take the statistics, uh, I'm not going to waste much of time. Globally, by the end of 2022, there are 39 uh, million uh, people living with HIV. Of that, majority is living in the African region and our region, Southeast Asian region, uh, is the second highest. So it has 10% of global HIV burden, especially in India. The huge number uh, is in India. Sri Lanka, uh, we are really fortunate. Our numbers are very small. By the end of 2022, we have 4,100 estimated people living with HIV. And of that, 86% are know their HIV status. And 84% those who know their status, majority are in the clinical service. So, uh, unfortunately, you can see the number diagnosed during each year is going up. That may be due to because we have more and more testing services, more people are coming and getting tested. That may be one reason why this number is going up. But on the other hand, we can't forget that actual new infection rate also may be going up because especially we see large num significant increase in number of syphilis, infectious syphilis and gonorrhea cases. So that indicate acute high risk behaviors because those are acute sexually transmitted infections. So with that, we can think that there is the new infections also may be going up. But according to the estimates, in new infections are going down, but we don't know those are estimates. So may or may not be correct. Anyway, the reported number each year is going up. So when it comes to the number of children living with HIV, we have very small number. So uh, in, these are the numbers. By the end of 2022, there were 35 children. 
this year unfortunately we had 37 new cases diagnosed uh, generally it is higher than the usual number uh, the number is not going up because they become adults after 15 they will go into the adult cohort that is why the number is not going up we were expecting the number to go down but unfortunately this year we got seven new cases so two from lrh uh, and um, three from purunagala one from monaragala and one from anuradhapur um, it okay all together seven cases this is a bit unusual so this, these cases, majority of these cases are new, not new cases, they are old children, but few new cases are also there. So two, two new babies, one baby was four months, other baby is also six months, I think. Both have undergone HIV testing in the first trimester of pregnancy, they were negative. Unfortunately, the mothers have got infected during the latter part of the pregnancy. So, so that risk is also there. Although they have undergone antenatal screening during first trimester, that does not 100% exclude the possibility because they can infect it at the latter part. And then the risk of transmission is much higher because they will have high viral load. They are seroconverting during pregnancy. The risk of transmission to the baby is very high. Uh, so we had seven babies. So although the numbers are small, it is very important for us to update your knowledge Therefore, whenever the cases come, these cases will never come to STD clinic. Unless their parents are diagnosed, we do the contact screening. Hmm? So they will present it to you all uh, or in the dermatology clinics, general practitioners. Uh, so it is important for you to know the indicator conditions. So what is the mode of transmission of HIV among children? So the majority will get from mother to child. So about uh vast majority i think uh, about 95 percent of our babies have got hiv from mother to child there may be very few uh, towards the adolescent period they may have sexually acquired so uh during pregnancy intrauterine it can go through the placenta but majority of transmission occur during intrapartum period during the delivery period because the baby's blood and the mother's blood will mix up. Therefore, it is important to detect early and make the viral load undetectable so that by the period of intrapartum, mother is virally suppressed. Therefore, the transmission risk will go down. And postpartum during breastfeed because the breast milk can contain significant number of viruses, especially because they drink volumes and the risk of transmission through breast milk for you all through handling breast milk is negligible because the, the amount of viruses in the breast milk is very very low but why does it transmit from mother to the baby any guesses why if you touch a breast milk even there's a finger prick and you touch the breast milk there is hardly any risk of transmission you don't need to be scared to handle breast milk but babies can get infected any any guesses So they, they drink volumes and volumes of milk. So more the volume, higher the risk. And inside the gut, there is huge surface area for them to go in. So it will be multiplied. Every day they, they drink volumes and volumes of milk. That's why it is infectious. But if you take per exposure, risk is very, very low as compared to a needle prick and other things. But uh, it is significant. Uh, and blood and blood products in Sri Lanka, it is very rare, but uh, unfortunately we see children injecting drugs now that has become, it's becoming a significant thing. I think adolescents can also inject. Therefore, you have to keep an eye about the injecting drug use, especially during uh, older children. And uh, it could be sexually transmitted also. Okay, So uh, that could be consensual sex as well as sexual abuse. So always you have to keep an eye. Think about because the, sometimes when the child is older, you might think it is unlikely because they are mother to child transmission. By this time, they should have symptoms. But it, it is not necessarily from mother to child. It can be sexually transmitted as well. Okay. Especially, you know, these child abuse cases will go unnoticed. 
they will never report. Huh? Therefore, always when there are indicator conditions, irrespective of mother's HIV status or sexual history or whatever, you need to consider HIV as one of the differential diagnoses. So the clinical features among children, I'm sure you may have some idea about the clinical features among adults and children can vary. So in infants and small children, the clinical features are different from adolescents. Adolescents' clinical features will be mostly similar to adults. Uh, so you have to be aware about what are the possible clinical features. Most infants, even though they are born to HIV-infected mothers, they will be asymptomatic at birth. Later only they will start developing symptoms. So initial signs and symptoms may be subtle or non-specific, like failure to thrive. In other countries, this failure to thrive clinics, they do HIV rapid testing because it is very common. So here also, you may have to exclude the, the common causes. Once you exclude the common causes, this should be one of your second line uh, investigations. Lymphadenopathy. This is also very common among children. Hepatosplenomegaly and tonic or recurrent diarrhea, interstitial pneumonia. That is also one of the different presentation in children as compared to adults, oral thrush. So if a very small child have oral thrush, that could be normal. But always when there is a child with oral thrush, you need to think about possibility of immunosuppression. Either maybe diabetic or maybe taking steroids or something or maybe a child. So you need to think of. So none of these things are specific for HIV. So you have to have a high degree of clinical suspicion. And it may differ from country to country as well. Especially in developed countries, the presentation may be different. Uh, so they have, can have systemic findings like weight loss, pulmonary finding. But in Africa and developing countries where they are malnourished, uh, more diarrheal diseases, infectious diseases, they might present with diarrhea, wasting, and malnutrition. So presentation also may differ from country to country. Earlier, uh, we also belong to the developed countries. Now I think we are going into poorer side. Our children are becoming malnourished. So they also might present like African children. So consider when you are investigating children for malnutrition and diarrhea, you need to consider HIV. So these are the common symptoms that you can find. Recurrent bacterial infection, chronic parotid selling, uh, lymphatic interstitial pneumonitis, early onset neurological deterioration. Sometimes they will gain neural development and deterioration of the development milestone may be the presenting feature. So uh, pediatric HIV, we need to uh, stage clinical staging and immunological staging. Both are very important. Both can correlate with each other, but sometimes they may not have any symptoms, but they immunologically, they may have a very low CD4 count, okay? So these clinical features are very important. So acute seroconversion illness, uh, especially in adolescents, especially children who are uh, managing after sexual abuse. If they complain of fever, arthralgia, rash, body aches, viral flu-like symptoms, you need to consider a child, okay? It's not written here, but it is very similar to any viral flu, so I don't need to explain what are the features of viral infections. So that will be similar, but if there is a risk of recent sexual exposure voluntarily or sexually abused, please consider HIV as the differential diagnosis. And remember that your test can become negative because they may still be in the window period, your test results can be negative, okay? So after that initial seroconversion illness, they will go into clinical stage one, two, three, four. As I told you earlier, clinical, so these are the WHO clinical staging. Clinical stage one, mostly asymptomatic. About 70% of them will not have any symptoms. And that period is very long. That might last for about 10 years. Some children, it may be two, three years. It depends on child's general immunity. So if they are malnourished, they will progress rapidly. If they have some other coexisting illness like diabetes or child uh, having tuberculosis, then they will progress rapidly. 
So any other coexisting infection, their progression will be fast. Few, about 30% will have persistent generalized lip factor. So hands up those who have investigated children for persistent generalized lip factor. Hmm? None? I suppose we are training. So how many of you have thought of HIV as a differential diagnosis? Huh? So I think it is first line things, common things are common, that's okay. But we are investigating your second line investigation, I think should contain HIV uh, antibodies as well, because uh, by taking the history from the child or the mother, you can't exclude the possibility of HIV. Okay, so uh, when you are investigating persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, please consider HIV as the one of the differential diagnoses, and at, it is much commoner among children as compared to adults. So they will more and more children will present with persistent generalized lymphadenopathy <laughs> because now I am telling the features of HIV. So it when, when it comes to your clinical practice, it's the other way around. You get a child with these symptoms, you need to think of a child and do. Okay, so remember these things so that you will uh, consider HIV as a differential diagnosis when it is necessary. Then comes the clinical stage two. This is actually very, very important to identify these features because by this time they have a preserved immunity. They have immunity is relatively preserved and they have milder symptoms. If you diagnose that they, them at this stage, their prognosis will be very good. Therefore, please remember to consider HIV as a differential diagnosis. Unexplained persistent heterosplenomy. So your common causes you can exclude first. If they are having persistent heterosplenomy, I think one of the last cases that we diagnosed here had heterosplenomy. And papillopurtic eruptions. So how many you have seen papillopurtic eruption in children? Hmm? So, uh, on a picture, so they can have pleuritic itchy papules in the exposed areas, only in the exposed areas, and they will be very extensive, and they will not respond to usual treatment. Usually, the steroid is the treatment of choice, local application of steroids and antihistamines, but it will not respond to usual treatment. It will progress, and they will have a lot of scars, in exposed areas, only in the exposed areas. So this is hypersensitivity to the uh, insect bites. Okay, so fungal nail infections. So recurrent fungal nail infections. Uh, also, you need to think of the possibility of immunosuppression and unexplained persistent fever. So when you are investigating children for persistent fever, have you thought of HIV? I hope you will consider HIV not as your first line. Of course, common things are common, but please consider because without that clinical suspicion, patient, because some of those patients, especially the, the 10 year old boy who presented to LRH, that child was born to several doctors with failure to thrive, fever, cough. But until patient came here, I think maybe 20 visits to other doctors, nobody has thought of HIV. So, uh, persistent fever, persistent oral candidiasis. That is also very important. When chil children present with oral candidiasis, you need to consider the possibility of some form of immunosuppression. It may not be HIV, but some form of immunosuppression. Oral hairy leukoplakia. So, uh, it is very similar to oral candidiasis. There will be longitudinal ridges in the lateral angle of the lateral angle of the tongue. So generally, candida, you can sob it off, but uh, oral hair leukoplakia, it will stay. It will not uh, remove, can, cannot be removed. So acute ne necrotizing gingivitis and periodontitis. Severe oral infections, you need to think of HIV. Lymph node TB, pulmonary TB, severe recurrent bacterial pneumonia. So when a child comes over and over again with pneumonia, you need to consider the possibility of uh, HIV. Okay. Uh, interstitial lymphocytic intestinal pneumonitis. That is, uh, I mean, mostly presenting in children. Adults, it's very rare. Therefore, uh, any patients with pneumonitis, your initial infections are negative, but still the patient is dyspneic and 
not responding to the normal antibiotic, you need to think about interstitial pneumonitis. And uh, bronchiectasis, I think our last child had bronchiectasis. Uh, unexplained anemia, cytopenia. Cytopenia is one of the common presentations of HIV. Okay, so when they have uh, cytopenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia, or neutropenia persistently, you need to consider. So, um, Uh, I miss some of these. So, extensive genital warts, extensive molluscum contagiosum, uh, recurrent oral ulceration, persistent alacid selling, herpes zoster. So, all these significant proportion are dermatological complications. So, when they have dermatological complications, uh, dermatological presentations, that's why we always, we are fond of uh, going and presenting to the Dermatology College of Dermatologists because even in adults, even in children, Dermatological presentations are very common and they are, uh, if you diagnose at this stage, the prognosis is very good. Therefore, uh, it's very important to suspect HIV in uh, these children. And uh, this is, the phone one is papillocrutic eruption. This is fungal nail infection, herpes zoster. This is molluscum contagiosum. So molluscum contagiosum, I know you may have seen purplish, pinkish dome-shaped papules with central umbilication. That is common among children, especially children in orphan age, because it's caused by the pox virus. It is infectious, but when it is extensive, especially when it involves the face, you need to think about the possibility of immunosuppression. So those are skin manifestations, because if you de detect them early, they will be, uh, their prognosis is very good, and with antiretroviral, all these lesions will go away. And then comes the clinical stage three, then they are, will be much more ill, they will be in the wards most of the time. So persistent oral candidiasis, oral healthy leukoplasia, uh, TB, pulmonary TB and lymph node TB. Any other TB, they will go into stage four because it is disseminated or extra pulmonary TB. Uh, so any TB patient, I think according to the Sri Lankan guideline, need to be offered HIV testing, even a child, even an adult. Uh, remember that sometimes when the TB is diagnosed in wards, you miss the HIV screening. So TB control program, they send blood from all patients. But when they are diagnosed in the wards, sometimes some of them haven't undergone HIV screening. So it should be 100%. Unless patient refuse, you need to consider uh, HIV test among any patients who is diagnosed with TB and not only diagnosed with TB, I think suspected of TB, that is also important. Now patients are coming with loss of appetite, loss of weight. TB screening done, it is negative. So what is the other differential diagnosis? It could be HIV. So not only those who are suspected of TB and confirmed TB, suspected TB and negative ones also, it is better to offer an HIV test because TB is negative, HIV could be the reason. There were enough patients uh, who have undergone CBT in several signs. I think this child also have undergone CBT in several signs. Only during last admission, the uh, child has undergone HIV screen. So, uh, therefore, it is important. And uh, cytopenias, as I told you. So, by this time, child has, most of the time, they may have lost significant weight. And also they may have fever, they are ill, they are not that healthy, but we can survive them. If they are diagnosed at this stage they, and started antiretroviral therapy, their survival is also good. Okay, So this is oral uh, candidiasis and lymphadenopathy and uh, TB. Okay. So uh, then go into the AIDS-defining conditions or the clinical stage 4. Okay, so those are the age-defining conditions. Unexplained severe wasting, stunting, or severe malnutrition. Unlike in adults, so children, it may not be the weight loss. It may be failure to thrive. Okay, so, uh, and you, you try to replace their nutrition, but still they are not responding. So you need to think, not the first child who comes with malnutrition. So you can do the normal management. If it is not responding, you need to think of a child. And pneumocystis pneumonia. So pneumocystis durosi is an organism which is not infectious to normal healthy adult people with immunity, good immunity, 
but they can get infected once their CD4 count go below 200. And uh, recurrent severe bacterial infection. So when they start getting recurrent bacterial infection, it goes into its defining condition, esophageal candidiasis. So whenever you do endoscopy, if there is esophageal candidiasis, I'm sure they will do a HIV screen. Uh, Kaposi sarcoma, CMV infection, CNS toxoplasmosis. Those I think everybody knows, so I uh, I don't want to explain it further because these are severe infections. These are AIDS defining conditions. These patients will be managed under specialist care. I'm sure those specialists will think of HIV as a differential diet. So my main concern is not these AIDS defining conditions. Yes, you should not miss these cases, but you have to concentrate more on more subtle cases where you tend to miss, okay? And if you detect them, the prognosis is much better. And HIV encephalopathy and uh, extrapulmonary cryptococcosis, chronic, uh, so the is a list, okay? HIV associated nephropathy, high band. So these conditions, so then they are presenting with nephrotic syndrome or other unexplained renal conditions, you need to consider HIV also as a differential diagnosis. So uh, esophageal candidiasis, PJP pneumonia, uh, persistent H HSV infection, cerebral toxoplasmosis where you get the ring enhancement lesions and progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So as I told you, we need to stage them clinically as well as immunological. So immunological staging is very important. Whenever you interpret a CD4 count in adult, uh, children, always you have to refer to these tables because I also can't remember. Because the CD4 count interpretation in, and in young children, you know, the counts are different. So always you have to interpret with the CD4 percentage and counts also might differ. Therefore, always refer to these tables according to the child's age you have to uh, interpret whether it is severe or mild or moderate okay so uh, then the respiratory diseases are the commonest way of presentation most of them will present with respiratory diseases pneumocystis pneumonia recurrent bacterial infection tb viral infection fungal infection and uh, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis. Those are the common presentations of respiratory. We will discuss it because this is these are the commonest presentation. Pneumocystis pneumonia. So it is one of the commonest. So I, uh, so the clinical features is dyspnea on exertion. Sometimes they may not have any other features. May have dry cough. Dyspnea on exertion. So. Uh, Consider among patients whom you are evaluating, if there is no wheezing or progressively worsening dyspnea on exertion, pneumocystis pneumonia is an important uh, diagnosis, especially children who are wasted and having papillocrutic eruption. Please consider PJP and do HIV because uh, when you do the HIV, only th you think of PJP. Otherwise, it is uncommon among uh, HIV negative individuals. And... Uh, Exertion and desaturation is common. So X-rays may not show anything. Early stages, X-rays, there will not be any changes. But later, they can have interstitial infiltration. Uh, and treatment is for trimoxazole. And if they are not treated, then they are. The, the important thing, when you are managing the child in the very early stage, if you diagnose them and start treatment promptly, that is why doing a HIV test at that stage is important. Uh, they will go into respiratory distress and they will die. But if they survive, their prognosis is really good. Recurrent bacterial infection. That is very common among children. Unlike in adults, recurrent, they are coming with recurrent pneumonia. So you need to think of the possibility of HIV. And so initially, it may be like a normal bacterial pneumonia. But when their immunity goes down further, they will start getting it more and more frequent. So if you can pick them up early, their prognosis will be good. TB. As you know, in our this area, TB is we are medium prevalent country. So TB HIV co-infections are significantly common. And uh, they can have 
they are more likely, especially when their immunity is low, they are more likely to have extra pulmonary TB. They can progress rapidly, especially when they have extra pulmonary TB. So when you consider our death, we had about uh, 50 deaths. I think significant proportion of them die because of the TB. Okay, so the mortality is very high, especially among extra pulmonary TB. When it comes to children also, uh, it is very important to exclude TB because they may not have the classic features. Because of the lack of immunity, they will not have fever. They will not have cough. So there should be high degree of suspicion. Just a sputum gene expert, you may not be able to uh, exclude because they may not produce sputum. So you may have to do a bronchoalveolar lavage or do a bronchoscopy and get a good sample and do a DNA expert. Just because they, if they are coughing, then it's okay. If they are not coughing, it's just a dry cough. It is unlikely that you will get. And your man too is uh, most of the time misleading because when their immunity is low, they will not have reactive man too. And AFP is also uh, not that reliable, but gene expert is fairly reliable. Therefore, if you suspect immunosuppression, better to go for gene expert. And uh, their risk of developing TB is about five to ten fold higher as compared to HIV negative. But they, they majority they will respond to the standard TB treatment, but some may need a longer duration of treatment. Then comes the viral infection. So these are common, especially influenza and the normal uh, common viral respiratory syncytial virus. Those can be they are in not preserved immunity, but uh, especially towards the latter part of uh, the infection. So cytomegalovirus, especially severe cytomegalovirus infection, where when their CD4 count is less than 50, we need to think about viral infections as well. Even a normal viral flu, they can go into respiratory distress and die because of the low immunity. Fungal infections. When their immunity goes down, especially less than 50, we have to think about the pulmonary candidiasis, aspergillosis, those things we need to consider. Mm -hmm. And lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, that is mostly common among children. So exact etiology is unknown, but uh, it may be due to exaggerated immune response to in inhaled antigens, or it may be the primary HIV infection involving the lung or it may be due to epsilon bar virus infection or both. Okay? Most of them may be asymptomatic. In that case, we don't need to give a special treatment, but sometimes they can have tachycardia, cough, wheezing, hypoxia, clubby. So in severe cases, the radiological diagnosis is reticular nodular pattern uh, persisting for more than two months. So initially, you need to think about other common causes. When those are excluded and with those treatments, the patient is not improving, then you need to consider the possibility of HIV. And uh, histology could be done, that, is, that will confirm the diagnosis. Management is steroids. So you need to give long-term steroids until they recover uh, immunologically. So starting antiretroviral therapy early is also important because then only they will recover uh, their immunity. So gastrointestinal diseases are also common. It could be infections like bacteria, fungus, and viruses. Especially when their CD4 count is low, you have to think about atypical infections like CMV colitis uh, mm. and uh, non-tuberculosis bacteria like my bacterium avium causing diarrhea, and also uh, Things like cryptosporidiosis, isosporidiosis, those are common only among patients who have a CD4 count less than 50. So if, they, if you think the patient is immunosuppressed, so CD4 count is very important to come to your differential diagnosis. Okay? So AIDS enteropathy. So HIV virus itself can infect the gut, causing enteropathy. They can have chronic diarrhea. They can have partial villus atrophy. Uh, so treatment in those patients will be uh, antiretroviral therapy. So sometimes when they present with diarrhea, you need to explore possible cases. You have to start with antiretroviral therapy because it may be the HIV virus causing diarrhea. 
But remember, that is a diagnosis by exclusion. As soon as you get to know it is HIV, uh, everything is due to HIV. Anemia in HIV, okay, HIV induced anemia. But remember, those are diagnosis by exclusion. So you need to exclude opportunistic infection because once you start antiretroviral therapy, they will regain the immunity. They will start producing symptoms if those OIs are not treated before starting AR. Okay, so we have a high, should have a high degree of suspicion about infections and do active investigations and exclude uh, other possible infective causes. And they also can have liver. So it may be hepatitis B and C co-infection, cytomegalovirus infection, HIV virus itself can affect the liver, can cause the, uh, alteration of liver enzymes, or it could be opportunistic infections like mycobacterium avium. Pancreatitis is relatively uncommon, but mycobacteria and CMV also can cause pancreatitis. Neurological diseases. It is a very important cause in HIV infected children because they can have, uh, generally they won't present at the beginning, it will start in about one and a half years, uh, that is the median age of presentation, they can have progressive encephalopathy, so that is due to HIV virus itself. They can have meningitis, it could be bacterial meningitis, it could be TB meningitis, it could be cryptococcal meningitis, and toxoplasmosis. Uh, Cerebral toxoplasmosis is relatively uncommon among children. In adults, it is relatively common. Okay. So cardiovascular diseases. Also, they can have cardiovascular diseases. Uh, if untreated, they can have progressive. Uh, there can be cardiomegaly and uh, impairment of uh, cardiac function. And they can progressively deteriorate. And uh, those who have encephalopathy and age-defining illnesses, or especially those children are presenting with late stage, they can have cardiovascular diseases. Okay. So, renal diseases, nephrotic syndrome and retinopathy, HIV-related nephropathy, uh, retinopathy. So, when you are investigating unusual cases of uh, renal diseases, you need to consider HIV as one of the differential diagnoses. As our prevalence is less, uh, the likelihood of uh, getting positivity is less, but if you miss the cases, their prognosis will be very bad. Therefore, uh, by doing a HIV test, don't think about the cost for the HIV test because you can do 1,000 tests than managing a late-stage patient. When they now last baby we managed in uh, ward 4, uh, baby had uh, uh, CMV, congenital CMV disease, we had to give, uh, and with neurological involvement, we had to give IV Gansaclia for six weeks. So I think it, the cost is, I can't remember, it may be millions. So, so managing one patient, you can do thousands and thousands of HIV tests. Therefore, in a low prevalent country like ours, it is okay to do HIV tests, even your reports come as negative. So, uh, diagnosis, that is an important area, I think, because uh, before 18 months, you can't diagnose them by doing antibody tests. Uh, after 18 months, usual adult algorithm, you can practice the same thing. Okay? So, uh, so, suppose if there is a baby who was born to HIV positive pregnant mother, then uh, so we, we generally we will do one uh, molecular test at birth. So that will indicate whether they have acquired in utero. Okay? The perinatal transmission will not be uh, indicated here. So if the at birth one is negative, that means the child has not get, got infected in utero. But you have to do a repeat one, four to six months, um, uh, eight at eight weeks. Generally, we give prophylaxis. Uh, up to eight weeks. So after eight, uh, up to six weeks, we give prophylaxis. So two weeks after stopping prophylaxis, we will do another molecular test. And third one, four to six months later. Okay. So if all these are negative, we can safely exclude the possibility of HIV. Now sometimes children presenting for immune uh, vaccination. So uh, 
once we, we, we send a letter saying that the HIV is safely excluded, you can give any vaccines, but many vaccines could be given. We will discuss about the vaccination as well. Uh, so definitive exclusion of HIV infection in non-breastfeeding infant is based on two or more negative virological tests. One obtained one month and one obtained more than four months or two negative antibodies. Sometimes you get children preferred from orphanages. Mother is not there. And you can't do molecular testing for each and every baby. Okay? Therefore, we need to do antibody tests. How can we exclude by doing antibody tests? If it is an antibody test only, it needs to be obtained after six months. And there should be more than two negative antibody tests. Okay? So, we can't afford to do molecular testing for all babies who are suspecting HIV. So you can order an antibody test. If it is positive, that need to be con uh, confirmed with a molecular test if the baby is less than 18 months. Okay? So if they are more than 18 months, you can do the normal antibody test. Uh, but uh, by antibody test only, you can't exclude HIV until 6 months. And then you have to do two antibody tests. Remember, sometimes you get children uh, from orphanages. No mother is there. But if you suspect HIV in a child, best thing is to do the antibodies in the mother. If the mother is available, always do the antibodies in the mother unless you suspect sexual transmission. If the mother is available, they, that will be easier because you can do an uh, antibody test and that will give you a clue. So, if they are breastfeeding, in addition to those tests, you have to make sure that they are monitored every month and the last test should be done six weeks after cessation of breastfeeding. So, when you are investigating children uh, who are coming without the mother, especially when the children in the orph orphanage, try to get the last breastfeeding date. Otherwise, you don't know. They may have breastfed and they left the child about a month back. You do an antibody test, it is negative. You still don't know whether the child got infected or not. So carefully try to exclude the possibility of transmission through the breast milk as well. So it should be at least six weeks after cessation of breast milk. So once the uh, screening test becomes positive, then always, if, even if a molecular test becomes positive, always we have to take a fresh sample and do a repeat molecular testing when two molecular testing is become positive only you confirm it but you may not have to wait until the molecular result is available because in children you have to start quickly so you can start treatment at with the first molecular test always confirm it with the second molecular test even if it is an antibody test if the child is small less than 18 months you have to confirm it with molecular test so, more than 18 months, it will be like adults. Okay, so you do the screening test. Uh, either you can draw a blood and send to the laboratory, laboratory-based test like ELISA or particle aggregation, or it may be a point of care rapid test. The lab, remember, rapid tests are available in the LRS lab. Okay, so you can get it done within 20 minutes or at least within half hour, one hour. Okay, so it is available in the LRH lab. If it is not there, you can always request from our uh, STD control program. We always keep uh, uh, stock of uh, rapid tests in LRH lab, so it is uh, easily accessible. Okay, so once the initial screening test become positive, that doesn't confirm the diagnosis. We have to do a confirmatory test. Earlier, we have been doing Western work. It takes time because we collect samples and do it once a week. Now it is different. Uh, we can do three tests, three different tests, and all three serial tests are positive. Then it confirms the HIV in a child more than 18 months. If it is below 18 months, we can do molecular testing. So molecular tests also we have um, point of care molecular testing where the results can be available on the same day. So you can screen with the normal antibody test. If it is less than 18 months, we can do the molecular testing very quickly. So always communicate with the lab so that you can get the reports early. Okay. So um, 
if you just send the sample we think that it is not turgen it will go as the routine so whenever there is a suspicious baby uh, i think you can call the lab and arrange it uh, and get it done quickly even the molecular testing because uh, the expert machine do one one single test so they can that will be available within the same day itself so this is the national algorithm when a newborn born to hiv positive mother then they undergo dna pcr this is the same thing i explained you i think uh, it's not necessary so once you do the test especially when you become consultants when you uh, you may be working as general practitioners make sure that you you have to do hiv testing in suspected cases without doing you will miss cases and they will progress and they might even die without knowing that they are hiv positive so do more tests it is very important that is why those indicator conditions are important remember those conditions those are in our national testing guideline so if you can't remember it's there in our website you can download and there is pediatric indicator conditions you can refer that and uh, not only testing so make sure that those test positive are linked to care sometimes you do hiv test and you send discharge the baby and the baby will be gone home by the time the report is available so it's okay in a bc casualty i understand that you need beds you can discharge but remember to get the contact details and write it in the bhd clearly so that if you get a positive results you know how to contact it otherwise sometimes i can't remember any such thing in lrh but national hospital we get reports positive patient discharge no contact details so in vain you diagnose a patient but there is no way to contact so i'm sure you don't get a lot of positive so please make sure that they are linked to care so until they go into our clinic and register in one of our clinics it is your responsibility because you are the one who ordered the test so make sure to link them to care and provide comprehensive care because they need a team management so last few cases we we had a team pediatrician myself the chest physician uh, virologist so microbiologist so we were together and we took several decisions that is why we were able to uh, save both children i think so it is a multidisciplinary team management uh, not only during the acute stage i think during the latter part also they, their development need to be monitored carefully their growth uh neurological development everything need to be monitored i think your support is really needed in our pediatric patients sometimes they may be virally suppressed but their development may not be acute so we can do more researches and actually we can uh, improve our management as well so so once they become positive then we have to counsel them in detail because this will be a lifelong treatment so that will be a really shocking situation for a parent when the child becomes hiv positive so they need lot of support so we have to explain the availability of treatment how their prognosis is and uh, also it's very very important to do the testing of the parents if there is a suspicion of sexual transmission we have to ask the sexual partners and trace them so this is not uncommon i had a 15 year old boy who uh, presented with uh, actually it's a sexual transmission so they are he came through contact screening so likewise don't think it is only mother to child transmission there may be 15 year old who are sexually active therefore think about that as well uh, and sexual abuse it's very very important you have to consider the possibility of sexual abuse and it should be the other way around as well those who are presenting with sexual abuse please consider hiv testing and also post exposure prophylaxis those who are presenting within 72 hours have you thought of giving post exposure prophylaxis it's available in our clinic not only for uh, following uh, occupational exposure non occupational exposure especially sexual abuse it is there in our national guideline as well so please refer them quickly as soon as possible if they present within 72 hours please urgently refer them especially not these young girls and boys who have run away with their boyfriend that's okay but if the perpetrator is a 
person who has high risk behavior, there is a higher risk of sexual transmission, okay, uh, of HIV. So we can give post-exposure prophylaxis immediately to reduce the risk of HIV and uh, treating them with non-judgmental attitudes. Not only the patient, so sometimes you may be non-judgmental about the baby, but you may be judgmental about the parents. Okay, so it's very important. So sometimes it may not be you, it may be your other staff. So please make sure you are the team leader. You are going to be the team leader. So if someone else is discriminating the baby, they refuse taking blood, refuse giving care. Don't keep a blind eye. It's very, very important because uh, without your, your guidance or your uh, action, it will go unnoticed. So uh, I can remember when we managed, we, we had certain uh, difficult situations, uh, but the medical team was very supportive. Uh, other team, we had a uh, bit of a difficult situation, but somehow we could uh, overcome. Always those are there, especially when they, are no, they don't manage cases frequently, they are really scared. So if they take the necessary precautions, they are not at risk of acquiring HIV. So even if it, they get the exposure, post-exposure prophylaxis is there. We can always, uh, it's available in LRH as well. Even during a weekend night, you can access it. So you can't avoid giving them care. It's very important. And uh, risk of onward transmission. So they can pass it on to others, including health care workers. So we have to take the necessary precautions and we have to know. And disclosure. Disclosure is important, not here. I think you know, if it is a older children, so disclosure to children is a very, very important area. It is not a simple thing that need to be done by a person who is very experienced in disclosure. Uh, generally, for children, we do a stepwise disclosure. According to the age, first we tell them, okay, now uh, you have some immunity problem. So you know what the immunity is. It helps you to stay stronger. So you have a bit of a problem with that. But if you take these medicines, you will be okay. So like that, depending on the age of the children, we explain them because when they are very small, they will take whatever the pill that their mother says. But they, when they become adolescents, they are anyway problematic. No? So when they have to go to a clinic without knowing why, it is a real problem. So you have to maintain a good relationship with them and do a stepwise disclosure. And finally, you have to disclose them fully, especially before they become sexually active. When they become adolescents, about 12 to 14 years, it depends. In other countries, by 12 years, we have to finish disclosure. But in our country, the children are much smaller and they are psychological growth is also not that much so they are not that mature so parents are also reluctant to tell uh, so it is an important area but uh, it's always better to leave it to a person who is experienced in doing it okay so very important area so uh, so management involved giving prophylaxis for possible opportunistic infection antiretroviral therapy management of opportunistic infection adequate nutrition and immunization. Those are important areas. And clinical cause in children may be different from adults. So significant proportion, about 15 to 20, can have rapid progression. Within one year, they might even die. That is why any HIV diagnosed children starting antiretroviral therapy is an urgent thing. So majority, but 80% will have slow progression. But very rarely, they can have long-term survivors or long-term non-progressors. Don't think because the child is 12 years, it is unlikely because they should have symptoms. No, that is not the case. Rarely, there could be children who progress very slowly. Therefore, if you have an indicator condition after excluding the common causes, please consider HIV. So that is my take-home message. Uh, so the progression can differ from child to child. So if they, are CD, if they are very low CD4 count, if their immunity is low, we have to give quotrim. But for children less than five years, if they are diagnosed with HIV, it is better to give quotrimoxazole to all children less than five years. Uh, but if they have clinical stage two and four, three and four, anyway, they need to be on 
for trimoxazole prophylaxis. <laughs> but in settings where the malaria and bacterial infections are common, like Africa, even older children, they will give cotrim prophylaxis. But in our setting, I think we can go to a, though we are not far beyond the developed countries, health-wise, we are more uh, close to the developed countries. So uh, our, we are low prevalent country for malaria and even bacterial infection. So it may depend on the setting. If the child is from a very poor socioeconomic setting, where are this Vata area, we are full of infections, then you may consider giving prophylaxis even for a older children. So that need to be tailor-made from patient to patient. Uh, in addition to HIV positive ones, also HIV exposed infants, sometimes we may have to give cotrim prophylaxis unless until HIV is excluded. Earlier, we have been giving to all HIV exposed babies. Now, most of the mothers are virally suppressed by the time of delivery. Therefore, there is a very low risk of HIV for the infants. So both those children, we will not give cotrim prophylaxis. But those who are delivered to mothers with high viral loads, they are high risk of getting HIV. So until the HIV is excluded, we can give cotrim prophylaxis. But that need to be started about four to six weeks after birth, not soon after birth. Okay, so INH prophylaxis, that is uh, another uh, important area, but that will be clearly given in the TB guidelines. So I'm not going to touch on that. And drugs, so antiretroviral therapy. There are uh, seven classes of antiretroviral therapy, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. So these are, I think, uh, when you consider the life cycle, those different sites, replication cycle is blocked in different places. So the first four drugs are available in Sri Lanka. NRTI, NNRTI, PI, and integrase inhibitors. Those are the four classes that are available in Sri Lanka and that is available in most of the developed countries as well. So we are not that bad in that. So generally, earlier we gave single drug. It is like TB, like leprosy. If you give monotherapy, it will develop resistant very quickly. So uh, to avoid resistant, generally we give multi-drug therapy three different drugs from different classes. Generally, we combine two NRTIs into the third drug, either NNRTI interface inhibitors or protease inhibitors. Okay, so two drugs from the first class and one drug from one of the other three classes. And uh, this combination is given to avoid developing resistance. So, Earlier in the course, we didn't treat patients who have a preserved immunity. Now it is different. Now the policy is to treat all. So irrespective of the CD4 count, as soon as they are diagnosed, they will be started treating. Uh, but um, rapid initiation is the policy now. We try to start within one week. Some patients, they get tested and they become positive. On the very same day, they start we start treating because it is if they are ready, if the patient is ready, if they don't have any significant opportunistic infection, we start them treatment on the same day. Uh, if children also, we have to consider it as an important thing and start treatment as early as possible. But there are certain conditions like TB meningitis, cryptocal meningitis. Especially when you suspect CNS infection, you should not start uh, antiretroviral treatment. Uh, any, anybody know why? Hmm? You are telling something, but I can't hear. Huh? Why? We are concerned about CNS infections. Hmm? Iris, no? So, especially CNS iris, so any place, it's not only CNS, any place you can get iris, TB, you can get iris, uh, any infection you can get, but CNS iris can be fatal. There can be increasing intracranial pressure, herniation, and patient might die. Therefore, in CNS infections, it is always better, especially TB and cryptococcal. Always you have to treat that first and wait for about one month or six weeks. 
then start antiretroviral therapy. But other sites, you can start treatment quickly. Now, within two weeks of TB treatment, any other sites, we start antiretroviral therapy. Because longer you wait, patient will develop another opportunistic infection and die. They can get different opportunistic infections. Okay. So, uh, so these are the antiretroviral drugs. Abacavia, Zidovidine, Tenafavia, Lamudine, and Entistibine. So we combine either Abacavia, Zidovidine, or TDA or SHAP with either Lamudine or Entistibine. And third drug will be selected from one of these three groups. Okay. Generally, the selection is from the third group now. Our, oh. our liver antiretroviral therapy, we give interface inhibitors. Dolutegravir is the first choice for adults and children both. Uh, so, uh, don't uh, you don't need to know details about antiretroviral therapy, but just be familiar with the drugs. These guidelines are all available in our. Uh, so this is the the first line preferred regime, Abacavir. So in children, you generally the adults first line regime is tenofovir, amphetamine, and dolutegravir. But for children, we can't give tenofovir because tenofovir can impair the bone growth. Their growth can be impaired. Therefore, children uh, less than 30 kilos, we prefer to avoid tenofovir, which is the adult first-line treatment. But abacavir and zidodine, we can start for children. Okay. So in, uh, in children, it is very important to, uh, when, when you are providing, so you have to select the preferable drug. It is different from adults. So any age group, there is a recommended drug. So we have to choose that. And also we have to do the dose adjustment according to the play. So these are growing children. So each time they come to the clinic, we have to measure and adjust their dose. Because if you don't adjust, what happens is they will, uh, they will uh, not So uh, if you don't adjust the dose, what happens? They will have low levels of antiretrovirus. Therefore, they will quickly develop resistance. Therefore, very, very important to adjust the dose in children because they are rapidly growing. Last visit, their weight may be different. This visit, their weight may be increased. Therefore, each visit, we need to measure the weight and adjust the dose. Otherwise, they are more likely to develop resistance than the adults. And uh, Drug interactions and food drug interactions need to be considered. So, especially now, as our first line treatment is Dolchegravia, chelating agents like iron, calcium, which are commonly prescribed to these children, <coughs> will impair the absorption of Dolchegravia. Therefore, uh, so we have to separate them from Dolchegravia. So, the, I don't think you can remember all these drug interactions, and it is not necessary. Only thing, whenever you are adding a drug to a pediatric HIV patient, it's better either check the drug interactions or inform the venibologist who is taking care so that we can see whether that there is a contraindication or we need to do a dose adjustment. Otherwise, the risk is, unlike other things, if, the, if they may have a subnormal blood level of drug, they will have resistance. There is a risk of developing resistance. Okay. Even food, some drugs, there is a need to take with food or two hours after meals. So all these needs we need to consider. And as you know, this antiretroviral therapy will only suppress the viral replication. So you need to give them treatment for the rest of their life. If you stop treatment, they will, the viral load will shoot up again. Okay, Because there can be silent disavirus. So these viruses will send, uh, be reactivated after stopping antiretroviral therapy. So according to the available evidence at the moment, there is no cure. But in future, they might find cure. Okay, so at the moment, they need to be on lifelong treatment. But there are new developments. Now we treat generally not only with three drugs. Sometimes we can treat with two drugs. But for children, it is not recommended. But there are Maybe recommendation coming later on. At the moment, the, we don't give dual therapy for children. Um, and also there are injectables. So that is also not yet recommended for children. But adults, they are giving once in two months 
uh, once in six weeks. Like it is also not available in Sri Lanka, but those things might come to Sri Lanka also very soon. Uh, so the aim of treatment is to long-term viral suppression, preserve immunity, minimum side effect, and we have to prevent development of resistance. And we have to see whether the, whatever the drugs is convenient for the patient and try to give once daily as much as possible. So uh, sometimes uh, you give twice a daily for children going to school. They find it really difficult to come take the morning dose. So that may be the reason for their uh, lack of compliance. So we have to simplify the regime as much as possible because this is a lifelong treatment for small children. And children, we have real difficulties because we don't have enough pediatric formulas. They have to take multiple number of pills and they are... Their formulas are not as user friendly as adults. We have all fancy formulas for adults, but unfortunately, our children formulas are not that uh, user friendly. Still, we have to give uh, twice a day regimes and multiple pills, uh, so it's difficult. Especially in a country like ours, we have 35 children. Imagine how difficult it is to get drugs. So no drug company is interested about purchasing about 300 packs of a particular drug. Therefore, it is really hard and nobody registered in the NMRA. So each time people discuss about taking no objections and taking drugs and it's, uh, people think that they are trying to so manipulate. Or, but unfortunately, majority of antidote viral, no registered suppliers. So no option other than getting the no objection letters. They are not interested at all in registering because it's not beneficial for them. Very small number of children are getting these drugs. Therefore, uh, and the benefits, there are lots and lots of benefits. So definitely morbidity and mortality is reduced uh, by giving antiretroviral and they will recover immunologically and that will hold the progression into more severe stages and they improve the growth. So without antiretroviral, their growth will be impaired and even second development of secondary sexual characteristics will be uh, Optimal if they are on antiretroviral therapy uh, and uh, viral suppression and immune activation. That is another important area. Earlier, we have been delaying giving treatment until the CD4 is suppressed. But now the evidence says when there is viral replication, there is immune activation that can cause ischemic heart disease, other complications. Long term, non communicable diseases risk is more. By viral suppression, that also we can reduce to a very good extent, but not to a normal level. So these HIV infected children have a much higher risk of developing cardiac, uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, compared to HIV negative uh, population. So we have to maintain the other risk factors as much as possible and neurodevelop. Without antiretroviral therapy, their neurodevelopment will be delayed, but optimizing viral load and maintaining good viral load, we can uh, optimize the neurodevelopment as well. So the most important thing is when they are virally suppressed, they will not pass the infection to others. So we are very happy some of our mother to child transmission children, now they are getting married. So uh, they are getting married, they are virally suppressed, they are doing very well, their growth is not every child. Some children with good family support. Now we have 18 year old, 22 year old. So about 20 years back when I was a registrar, I've seen, I was assisting the uh, delivery. So I can remember this, unfortunately this baby became positive because they were not on treatment. Uh, and now they are 22 years like that. They are doing very well. So some of them gets married. So when they disclose their partner and they come for family counseling and they, they deliver children, HIV negative children. So it is very successful. Actually, the treatment is very successful. It all depends on the compliance of the patient. So if they are taking treatment, they will have a normal lifespan and they can have a normal life and die of something else not related to HIV. So the treatment is that successful. So if they are following the medical advice accordingly, and once they become virally suppressed, their risk of transmission is zero. So those children, uh, so if they want to have children, we can advise them to have unprotected sex. So you don't need to have any assisted reproductive techniques. If they are virally suppressed, their risk of transmission is 
zero. Okay, so that is practiced widely now, and it is recommended by the WHO to promote that. Uh, but they need to be on treatment. They need to comply 100% with treatment as long as they are maintain their viral load undetectable, even if they have unprotected sex. So if you are taking care of a HIV positive child who is on treatment virally suppressed, you can do any surgery, any procedure, no risk at all. So if you are managing a patient with not virally suppressed, you have a prophylaxis. You take it within one hour. There will be 100% uh, uh, reduction if you take within one hour. Okay? So don't hesitate to provide services for HIV positive children because there are enough ways to prevent. Unless you are really careless, you can't get HIV from occupational exposure. So you should be careless to get a prick. You should be careless to not do anything after the prick. You have to check the source patient. And if the source patient is positive, you will be given post exposure prophylaxis immediately. All these services are widely available all over the country in all base hospitals in a 24 hour accessible place. Therefore, there should not be any reluctance to provide services to HIV positive children, whether they are viral suppressed or not. Okay? So, the government has provided all necessary facilities. So, uh, and we can give the services while protecting ourselves as well. Okay. So nutrition is another important area due to various reasons. They can have malnutrition. Due to HIV itself, they have got uh, inflammation and villi atrophy and they can get malnutrition due to diarrhea, very opportunistic infections, or they may be very poor, they may be unable to afford food. So nutritional replacement and nutritional rehabilitation is also very important. And it may be just micronutrient deficiency. So always look into those sides as well. And the immunization. So just because the child is HIV positive, you should not stop them getting vaccines. So majority of the vaccines can, can be taken. Especially only live vaccines cannot be given to HIV infected children who are symptomatic. Even if they are HIV infected, if they are asymptomatic, you can give the vaccines. Okay. So any other vaccines? So two vaccines in the EPI, uh, BCG and oral polio vaccines. These are the two live vaccines uh, at the beginning until we exclude the HIV. So if the baby is high risk of getting HIV, you can avoid giving the BCG at birth and wait until HIV is excluded. Uh, those who are born to a virally suppressed mothers, the risk is very minimal. Over the years, we haven't, ha haven't had any cases, HIV positive babies who were born to a HIV positive mother who are virally suppressed. So it is a very successful story. Not a single case who were born to mothers with virally suppressed. Those babies can be given BCG even at birth. Or you can wait until four months where we can exclude by molecular test. Okay. The oral polio vaccine can be, can be safely replaced by IPV. So we can give the second two months, four months and six months. By six months, it is generally excluded. But even when they are positive, you can give the IPV and give the normal vaccination schedule. So there is a list of vaccines which are could be given to children in our national guideline. You can go through that. Mm. And long-term monitoring. It's very important, both monitoring, neurocognitive development, development milestones. All these things need to be monitored because even when they are viral suppressed, there could be some effects of exposure of HIV virus into this developing brain. Okay? So, uh, before viral suppression, they may have exposed to this HIV virus for a long period of time. So there could be impairment in the growth. So you need to monitor them carefully and do appropriate intervention to minimize the adversities. So those may be children not born to non-positive mothers or diagnosed during pregnancy. Those children will be monitored regularly and most of them will be negative. But the children who diagnose late they are exposed to HIV virus. Their brains are exposed for 
relatively a significant period of time. So their monitoring is very, very important. And uh, disclosure needs to be considered when their children are growing, especially during adolescent period. We have to consider HIV disclosure. And uh, sexual health and contraception, especially adolescent age group, we have to discuss their sexual health needs and uh, contraception and those things also need to be discussed. Especially some of those children are coming from a mothers who are more prone to marry young age and their children also may be living in the same uh, environment. So they may also start their sexual life early. So we have to consider those things also uh, accordingly. So those children, in addition to that, they will also be monitored, especially viral load monitoring is the most important thing. Liver function, renal function need to be monitored. In addition, viral load monitoring, if the viral load is detectable, then we have to do adherence counseling. After that, you repeat the viral load, even then that is positive, then we have to send resistance testing. So there is antiviral resistance testing that is still not established in Sri Lanka. We are trying to establish at the moment. Until then, we are sending a sample to India and we can check whether these drugs are working for them. And if not, we have to change it accordingly. So the biggest thing, I think biggest challenge of managing HIV patients, if you have managed any patient, it is the stigma and discrimination, okay? So even after knowing all these facts, still healthcare workers, not all, there is a certain uh, form of stigma. So we have to act uh, actively. So you can't keep an, you may not be discriminating, but somebody else under your care may be discriminating. You can't keep a blind eye. But you have to at least volunteer will ultimately realize it is not going to pass like this. So this is a way to give care without any hesitation. So they will ultimately uh, so well, manage less stigma, less fear of transmission. So all this stigma you need to avoid. And I'm going to just mention about mother-to-child transmission because pediatrician also is a part of uh, mother-to-child transmission prevention. Sri Lanka is a country which has eliminated mother-to-child transmission of HIV. WHO certified Sri Lanka as a country which have eliminated. And in 2019, after that, in 2021, with COVID, we were able to maintain that. This year, again, will be revalidated and everything will be assessed. Uh, so your support is important. Uh, so as you know, the timing of HIV transmission, it could be intrapartum, peripartum, or after delivery through breastfeeding. The highest risk of transmission occurred during that. That is why you do the first test and the first trimester and try to make them virally suppressed as soon as possible so that by peripartum period, they are virally transmission is uh, very, very low, okay? Even after delivery through breastfeeding, it can pass on to the baby. So generally, without any intervention, if no treatment for the mother, transmission risk is about 25 to 45, but with intervention, it will go down to less than two. So uh, Sri Lanka also, we haven't had even a single baby who was born to mother who was given adequate treatment. Only those who were not given treatment had delivered babies. Now, very recently we had a 36-week week pregnant diagnosed that at that stage. We gave uh, antiretroviral therapy only for a few days. Elective section done, baby survived. Again, very recently we had a mother that was a miracle, I think, uh, diagnosed during the uh, peripartum period at labor room. Even if we said dose and the first dose of uh, antiretroviral, that is not, I don't think that is our management. That's God's management. Uh, because there was a high risk because mother uh, had rupture of membranes for more than 10 hours and delivered the baby. And we gave 
triple prophylaxis soon after delivery, but by that time the baby was exposed. Luckily, this mother had a very low viral load. So she is a, probably a light controller who had low viral load without antiretroviral. So it was about around 200, I think. As a result of that, the baby uh, uh, escaped from getting infected. So, uh, so uh, we can give the normal adult first-line treatment for HIV-infected pregnant mothers as well. But we, we, if it is close to the delivery, we try to give the best potent drugs that can reduce the viral load quickly. Even within two weeks, it will bring down to undetectable level. So the drugs are very, very potent. Even with a very short period of treatment, can bring down the viral loads to undetectable level by the time of delivery. So even if you diagnose them at the very late, just before delivery, you can intervene and do something. So uh, it is important to reduce HIV infection among young adults so that they will, once they become pregnant, they will not uh, uh, contribute to mother-to-child transmission. And when we detect a pregnant lady, we have to make sure they don't have unwanted pregnancies. So most of uh, our pregnant mothers, they don't get pregnant because they want children. They, it's just an unwanted pregnancy. So avoid unwanted pregnancies among pregnant mothers and screening of all pregnant mothers. All not already diagnosed ones, we have to offer screening to all pregnant mothers. And if they are detected positive, we have to start treatment early and try to bring their viral load to undetectable level as soon as possible. So the drugs, the first line drugs that we use, we will reduce the viral load within two weeks. It's that quickly. Okay? So some babies who were born to mothers who were diagnosed very late, we, we gave four drugs. So additional drugs are also given to reduce the viral load quickly. Uh, and uh, already diagnosed. If the mother is already diagnosed, then we recommend them to wait until their viral load is suppressed to get pregnant. By that, we can reduce the risk of transmission to a zero level. And or we have to closely monitor the viral load and make sure that the viral load is suppressed. Uh, especially at 34 weeks, we have to do a viral load. Uh, and mode of delivery. Generally, if they are virally suppressed, they can deliver even normally. It is okay, but generally in Sri Lanka, VOGs and we all prefer elective section because it is convenient. Everybody is available. If it is normal delivery, it can happen at 12 midnight. No one is available. Everybody will start panicking. Therefore, we we, we uh, sort of promote elective section, but there is no must. If they are virally suppressed, they can go for normal delivery as well. And uh, so if it is not virally suppressed, if the viral load is more than 1,000 copies, we recommend elective section because then the risk of transmission is high. So uh, babies, so all babies who are born to HIV positive mothers will be given antiretroviral therapy prophylaxis. If the mother is virally suppressed, then just one drug, nevirapine syrup is good enough that we can give for four to six weeks. If the mother is not virally suppressed, we prefer to give three drugs. Triple therapy, prophylaxis need to be given to the baby. So some specialists uh, recommend dual therapy, but anyway, single therapy, it's better to give dual therapy if the viral load as delivery is high or if the mother is diagnosed very late, later, latter part of the pregnancy, it's better to give triple therapy than single therapy. Okay. Feeding is the other one. Okay. So if the mother is virally suppressed, there is no hard and fast rule. If the mother is virally suppressed, we can even give breast milk. So we always counsel the mother and take a connective, collective decision. Pediatrician, a neurologist, mother, we all get together and discuss the possible options. Significant proportion of mothers opt for formula. They don't want to take the slightest risk. The risk is very low, but still one in 10,000 risk they don't want to take. So. We have formula milk uh, provided by NGO free of charge until they decide they can have safe alternative food. 
they will be given free formula okay but if somebody decide uh, to have breastfeeding so we monitor the mother's viral load closely and we allow them breastfeeding because some mothers they can't safe uh, safely feed the formula so if they are from a very low social economic state if their educational level is low the giving formula may, may, may be much riskier so in that case giving exclusive breastfeeding is much better but never allow mixed feeding that is very important why why can't you allow mixed feeding Hmm? Right. Any idea? Hmm? Yes, that's the exact reason. So if it is only breast milk, there is less chance of gut inflammation. So the risk of transmission is much less. If it is only formula milk, yes, there can be gut inflammation, but there is no HIV virus. So there won't be transmission. But when they are mixed feeding, so there is gut inflammation, which will facilitate the transmission of HIV virus if they take breast milk as well. So never encourage mixed feed. If they want to give formula milk, support formula feeding. If they want to give breast milk, support breastfeeding, but never allow them to formula. If they are breastfeeding, try to avoid mastitis. Uh, then if there is infection, the risk of transmission may be high, but all those things uh, are not important when the mother is virally suppressed. Okay? So mixed feeding should always be avoided. So that's all I think we had a long session. And all these uh, drugs and management, we have a pediatric uh, antiretroviral guideline, we have management of opportunistic infection guideline, and also mother to child transmission prevention management guideline. All these things are available in our website. Unfortunately, we don't have a separate pediatric guideline. So we are going to uh, prepare a pediatric guideline uh, probably this year. Yeah, and uh, so adult guideline have a chapter on the children as well. At the moment, we are managing with that. But we also use the WHO, CDC and other guidelines as well because our uh, numbers are small. We don't have separate, but we have planned to develop a pediatric guideline. So any questions, any clarifications we can ask? We generally follow the WHO guidelines, but some special conditions uh, it doesn't give uh, detail. Then we go for the uh, CDC guidelines. CDC, there is a pediatric uh, antiretroviral therapy guideline. There is opportunistic infection management guideline. So uh, for more details, always we go for other guidelines as well. But generally, whatever you need, it is, uh, it's available in our HIV testing guideline. We have indicated list of pediatric indicator conditions. So it's always good because you have to remember those things. And that is where you have to think of HIV. And if there is a case, the antiretroviral therapy management is they are in our uh, antiretroviral therapy guideline. The opportunistic infection management guideline also have the pediatric part also in most of the infections. Okay.